Today is the second Sunday after Pentecost, and the epistle is taken from the first letter of St. John, chapter 3. Dearly beloved, wonder not if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. In this we have known the charity of God, because he hath laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. He that hath the substance of this world, and seeth his brethren in need, and shut up his bowels from him, how doth the charity of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word nor in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Please stand for the gospel, which is taken from St. Luke chapter 14. At that time, Jesus spoke to the Pharisees this parable. A certain man made a great supper and invited many, and he sent his servant at the hour of the supper to say to them that were invited that they should come, for now all things are ready. And they began all at once to make excuse. The first said to him, I have bought a farm and must needs go out and see it. I pray thee, hold me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to try them. Pray thee, hold me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. And the servant, returning, told these things to the Lord. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the feeble, and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said to his servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. But I say unto you that none of these men that were invited shall taste of my supper. Please be seated. There are quite a few announcements. I won't read every single one of them, but we'll start off with the uh, bands of marriage. So uh, we announced for the first time the bands of marriage for Mr. Bryce Melu. Uh, have a look at the bulletin for that one, if you know him. Uh, he's from uh, Welwyn, Canada. Uh, he's marrying uh, Miss Hannah Field, formerly of this parish, who intend to marry in Canada on the 13th of August. Uh, anyone knowing any impediment to this union is obliged to notify Father McNamara as soon as possible. Also, we announce the bands of marriage for Mr. Simon Peterson and Miss Paige McDonald, both of St. Anthony's. They propose to be married on the 9th of July here at St. Anthony's Church. Anyone who has knowledge of, this, of any impediment to the union is obliged to notify the parish priest, Father Ladner. Uh, we announce for the first time the bands of marriage for Mr. Heinrich Bergstaller and Miss Chantel Piper, both of St. Anthony's, who propose to be married on the 6th of August at St. Anthony's Church. Anyone who has knowledge of any impediments to the union is obliged to notify the parish priest or Father Ladner. Uh, for the second time, we announce the bands of marriage between Mr. Henry Joseph Delphine and uh, Miss Belinda Mejorada, both from... Uh, the, our Auckland Parish, they intend to get married here at St. Anthony's Church on the 20, 25th of June. Anybody knowing of any impediment to their marriage is obliged in conscience to inform Father Lander as soon as possible. That brings us to the, the next announcement. It's a, it's a small correction. You'll notice in the bulletin on Saturday, it has a, an 1125 Mass, but there is a wedding on that day for uh, Joseph and Belinda. So... Uh, the, there won't be an 1125 Mass, but there will be a 1030 nuptial Mass. It'll be, it will be a sung Mass. So, good. No 1125 Mass, just a 1030 Mass. Also, the Bosco Cadets will be attending the 9 a.m. sung Mass next Sunday on the 26th of June. There will be a parade following the Mass, and the boys are asked to bring their backpacks. The second collection for next Sunday, which is the 26th of June, is going to be taken for the SSPX Sisters Novitiate in Browerville to support our New Zealand vocation, Juliana McKenna. There's lost property and lots of it. Um, it's no longer in the back of the church. It was kind of cluttering things up, so we've moved it to the main office. If you're missing something, if you just want a free missile, uh, if you don't know that perhaps maybe you're missing something, just check, just in case. It's probably mostly the Yoakimi stuff. But uh, I don't know. But uh, just have a look. There are many missiles. There's many, many things. Uh, if you want to have a look, just go down to the main office and, uh, and have it, have, check it out at some point. Please uh, pray for Mr. Louis Baden-Roper, who passed away 
on the early morning of Tuesday, the 14th of June. He was a parishioner at our Tawa Chapel. His uh, funeral will be held in uh, Johnsonville on Monday at 11 a.m. So please also remember to pray for Mr. Jeremy Piercy, also who pa- passed away last Friday. There's a girls' school music competition. There's no adult catechism on Tuesday this week. There's a quiz night coming up. There's an anniversary celebration for Father Elias. There's confirmations. So there's a lot of announcements. Please have a look at the bulletin, grab a bulletin, peruse it at your own leisure. Good. He sent his servant to tell those invited to come, and they all with one accord began to excuse themselves. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In uh, the parable that our Lord sets before the Pharisees this day, he, he speaks about a man who makes a... <coughs> big supper, a kind of grand banquet. He invites those who, he's, uh, who are loyal to him, those who are his friends, to come, at least who he thought was loyal to him, to come to this big meal, and he lays everything out. It would have been a big supper. It was the kind of supper that only, even though we only hear of uh, three, um, uh, three people who declined to come, apparently it was enough to feed all of the poor within the city and everybody in the highways and the hedges, so it was a, a big feast. And it would have been set forward at a great expense for the one who was holding it. So he, uh, he would have taken his, uh, his uh, cattle, he would, have, uh, he would have killed them, he would have set them out, he would have got all of his, his food to, to create a very big banquet. And uh, so at the same time, it was, it was a meal, but it was also a sacrifice on the part of the one who was giving it to them. And he invites them to come, and uh, one after the other... They, they decline to come and receive the, the banquet that's offered to them. Now, at face value, I think that the moral of the story of the parable seems to be that if you would like to enjoy the good things in life, don't become a farmer, don't buy cattle, and whatever you do, don't get married. At face value, it seems like that's what it's trying to say, but, but really, this idea of a sacrifice... And then this meal following, partaking of the fruit of that sacrifice is a common thread in, uh, in the parables of our Lord where he speaks of wedding feasts being held and people being invited, people not coming, people being uh, kicked out because of uh, the lack of wedding attire. Or even in St. John's Apocalypse where he speaks about the wedding feast of the Lamb and how those who make it to heaven are coming into this wedding feast of the Lamb. But also even in the Old Testament, going back and seeing the sacrifice of, sacrifices of the Old Testament, it wasn't only a vicarious um, killing, uh, death of something on behalf of the sins of the one offering it, but there was also this insistence often in many of the sacrifices that those offering it partake of the sacrifice itself. And so we have, especially if we look back at the Old Testament, just to look at that main sacrifice, one of the greatest sacrifices, one which symbolized our Lord's own uh, sacrifice on the cross very perfectly, which was the, uh, uh, the sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb at, at the Passover, particularly the first one when it was offered up at the exodus of the Jews from Egypt on the night of the Passover. We see, on the one hand, it's a sacrifice, there's a lamb that is killed, his blood is shed, and his blood is spread over the, the lintels of the door, and it's, it's that blood that's been shed that protects those who offered it from uh, the coming of the avenging angel. And yet at the same time, there's this strong insistence that it had to be eaten. It must be eaten. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it, its head with its legs and its inner parts and you shall let none of it remain until the morning. So five times when it speaks about uh, the sacrifice being offered, it says that it must be eaten. Five times it insists on this sacrificial meal, and in fact it had to be entirely consumed. It was a very essential part of the sacrifice, that it had to be eaten. And why? Because eating the victim, eating that sacrifice, it united the one offering it with the victim. It showed this communion between the one, the thing being offered, and the one uh, that it was being offered for. 
we, the, the book of Exodus doesn't tell us, but we might wonder what would have happened if there was a particular Israelite family who didn't really like the taste of, goat, of uh, lamb head or lamb entrails. And they thought, look, we'll offer up the sacrifice, but we're not necessarily going to, to ha- eat this whole thing, uh, much, much less a, even part of it. Um, and what would have happened if they decided not to do that? If uh, they just decided to, to be saved from the avenging angel by spreading the blood, they woke up in the morning, we don't know, it doesn't say, but, but I would presume that they would in, wake up to find their, their firstborn son dead. It, it, it was a strong push that they must eat of the sacrifice that would, was offered up for them. And so, again, why this insistence on eating? Because it was a sign of their union with the victim that was being offered up for them. And so we have, in parallel, our Lord's own sacrifice. He comes, he dies for us, he sheds his blood for us, and in in doing so, he prepares a big supernatural banquet of graces in this life through the sacraments, and at the same time, a banquet to come in the next life of beatitude and eternal bliss in heaven with God forever. And yet, if we don't partake of that sacrifice, if we don't unite ourselves with this sacrifice, it profits us nothing. Just like these uh, men in today's parable who were, had, they had the, the banquet prepared. It was there. It was waiting for them. I don't know how it stayed warm so long. It must have been a miraculous meal where it was, stayed warm long enough to go gather people up from the byways. But, uh, but it was all there. And because they chose not to come to it, they chose some worldly thing above Uh, They chose some other occupation above the call of the master of the house. The the meal profited them nothing. They gained no nourishment by it. They gained no joy from it. So again, similarly with our Lord, if we don't partake of his sacrifice, we're not united to Christ and his sacrifice, then it's going to be nothing for us. And so we'll say that we are united to to this sacrifice. Again, it's a when we receive the the sacrifice where you put in a state of communion with the victim, we're united to our Lord's sacrifice, I'd say, say in three ways. Firstly, as a priest. Secondly, as a victim. And then lastly, in the sacramental union that we have uh, with Christ in the, the sacrament of the Blessed Eucharist. So firstly, if we're going to unite ourselves to the sacrifice, it's not simply just coming and, and eating, but it's, it's participating in that sacrifice. Again, the whole reason for the eating was to show union with the sacrifice. And that's one area where the the Novus Ordo obviously drops the ball. So the meal in itself was was nothing. In fact, the whole point of eating the food was because it was part of a sacrifice. Of course, we know in the Novus Ordo there's this insistence really just simply on the meal and and, uh, to the detriment of remembering that it's truly a sacrifice. And yet the meal, if it's divorced from the sacrifice, means nothing because the meal shows that union with the thing being offered. And so, so again, firstly, we, we have to unite ourselves to Christ's sacrifice as, in a priestly kind of way. So how do we do that? Well, every sacrifice when, of the priest, he offers up sacrifice. And every sacrifice is a kind of act of preferential love, where we take some thing, some creature, and we set it aside for the sake of the love of God. We say, I prefer God over this other thing. We, we think about that even on a natural level when we, uh, we talk about a soldier sacrificing his life for his country. He's saying, I prefer the good of my country over even my own life. We think about a mother and a father who sacrifice themselves for their children. They're saying, I prefer the good of my children than any other happiness that I could have gone to, uh, to pursue just simply on my own, living for myself. And so with a sacrifice, we, we take some creature and we say, I'm going to set it aside out of a love of God, this supreme preference of God over any other created thing. And we we do this not in a just kind of vague, um, abstract sort of way, but really in the individual particulars of our everyday life. There are times where we say, I will have to sacrifice this friendship which draws me away from God because I prefer a love of God over, over this, uh, this human person. Or I will sacrifice this pastime that makes itself an occasion of sin for me. I'm going to sacrifice maybe some particular music, the use of social media, maybe um, uh, an attachment to the using the internet or drinking, or maybe some point of pride or vanity, or some grudge that we're holding. We're taking that, sacrificing it, setting it aside and saying, I prefer 
to have God over these things. And then secondly, we unite ourselves to our Lord's sacrifice daily as a kind of victim as well. So the purpose of the other kind of, uh, well, the purpose of the other kind of sacrifice when we're sacrificing things is in fact to sacrifice ourself. At the heart of all of the sacrificing of creatures that we make, there's a, in fact, we're sacrificing our own self. It's my use of this thing. I want this. And so by denying myself of this thing, I'm dying to myself. I'm dying to my own judgment, to my own desire, to, to my pride or whatever it is. And in fact, that's, that's exactly what God is asking us to do. He says, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, and yea, even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. We have our Lord speaking about the greatest and first commandment, saying that it's, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, with thy whole soul, and with thy whole mind. We read in the Psalms, a sacrifice to God is an afflicted spirit. A contrite and humble heart, O oh God, thou wilt not despise. So we, we offer up the main victim that we offer up in a priestly manner as a sacrifice, in fact, is really our own selves, preferring what God wants over what we want, even over what we are. And so again, if we're going to come to the sacrifice of Christ to unite ourselves to it, we have to do that in both those capacities. But then also we, we come to the sacrifice of our Lord and unite them to our Lord's sacrifice in the Mass. So we get the strength to make these sacrifices, to act as, as priest and victim, by coming and receiving the sacrament of sacrifice, which is the Blessed Eucharist. And we come, perhaps daily if we can, but, but at least at the end of the week on a Sunday, and we take all of these sacrifices and we place them on the pattern with Christ. We offer them up in union with our Lord's own sacrifices, the sacrifices of the past week. We look forward to the sacrifices uh, that the, we know that our next week will have to offer. We unite them to our Lord's and we offer them up. Because in fact, there aren't two sacrifices. Our sacrifice is not a kind of parallel sacrifice uh, next to our Lord's. It's not even a sacrifice that's just in imitation of our Lord. In fact, it's part and parcel of our Lord's own sacrifice. We say that there's one sacrifice of one Christ. When Christ offered himself up on the cross, he offered his own physical body, but he also at the same time offered up his uh, mystical body, which is the church. And so when we offer up our sacrifices, we're offering up the sacrifice of our Lord. In fact, again, it, it reminds us of a the word that we use to describe the sacrament, which is communion. It's this union with Christ in his sacrifice. And so we want to take occasion of, of the parable of today for, for us to remember that, that key point, that if we want to benefit from the sacrifice that Christ has for us, we have to come and we have to receive of it. And, by, and we can only receive of it by uniting ourselves to it. We unite ourselves to it as a priest, sacrificing things that get in the way between us and God, showing that preferential love of God above all things, above creatures, above ourselves, and uh, to make sure to do it always in union with our Lord's sacrifice, because it's a single sacrifice. We have uh, St. Peter saying, You are a chosen generation, a kingly priesthood, a holy nation, a purchased people that you may declare his virtues who hath called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. So we are called by God to be united to our Lord in his priesthood, in his victimhood, and uh, by that reap the benefits from it. The, uh, the people in today's parable didn't gain any of the benefits of uh, the, the meal that was offered for, him, even the, uh, for them, even though it was all laid out, because they chose rather some other distraction, some other occupation, and they, they lost out on the nourishment, on the enjoyment that came, would have come from joining in this meal. We don't want ourselves to get to the end of our life and never have, have always seen our Lord's sacrifice off and never actually approaching it, never actually receiving of it in Holy Communion often enough or maybe not receiving of it because not uniting ourselves in, by a daily union of, of sacrifice with our Lord. And then being condemned, hearing the words that uh, the master of the house said to those who he had initially invited, I tell you that none of those who were invited shall taste of my supper. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.